Hello everyone. I'm very fortunate today to have with me Professor Thomas Fuchs. Professor Fuchs is a psychiatrist, philosopher, and Karl Jasper, professor for philosophy and psychiatry at Heidelberg University in Germany. His uh, research areas lie at the intersection of phenomenology, psychopathology, and cognitive neuroscience, with a main emphasis on embodiment and activism, temporality, and intersubjectivity. He is coordinator of several international research projects, and he has authored over 300 scientific papers, book chapters, and several books, among which I want to mention Ecology of the Brain, the Phenomenology and Biology of the Embodied Mind. Professor, professor I have some questions on the embodied mind. Mm -hmm. First of all, what is the embodiment? Well, um, embodiment is a, a very pervasive term at the moment where um, everybody understands something different. So in my view, uh, we should start uh, with a, a short look at uh, the domin still dominant Western dualism, uh, which goes back to, um, well, even to Descartes. So uh, dominant Western dualism sees the body as something which is a mechanistic uh, whole, and uh, which is outside of our, of our embodied experience. So that is one part of the dualistic side. The other dualistic um, pole is the uh, subjective experience of the body. And this subjective experience of the body is completely um, inserted into the brain, so to speak. So on the one hand, our current paradigm sees the body as a me mechanistic system. On the other hand, my bodily experience is something that is completely, uh, well, contained in the brain. Embodiment would see both um, presuppositions completely different. Um, the body is not just a mechanistic system. The body is a living system. The body is a living whole. Um, the organism is not just composed of parts, but it is a self-reproducing uh, autopoietic whole which is the basis of my embodied experience. The other pole is uh, completely different and that's, uh, than Descartes saw it. It is not just a, a, a kind of um, body model in the brain, but it is my embodied experience which builds upon the, uh, em, uh, upon the uh, holistic uh, um, system of the organism. So embodiment in the end means that being a subject I'm not within my brain, but I'm an embodied subject, which is extended over my whole body, which is, um, uh, well, w moving and uh, feeling with my limbs and acting with my uh, limbs. And it is not something that is done externally uh, by commands of the brain. Mm -hmm. I'm this living body, I'm this embodied um, organism. Now, um, to put it a bit more precise, there are two major aspects or dimensions of this embodiment. First, we have to think of the uh, body and the organism as the basis of our feeling of being alive, I would say. So the basic uh, self-awareness is something that emerges from the whole body. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in interaction with the brain, of course, the brain is necessary to integrate bodily, um, um, a, a bodily afferences and bodily states, but and the brain is in constant interaction with the body, and only through this homeostatic regulation um, um, our embodied self-awareness emerges. So if we are conscious beings, we are already embodied conscious beings. The other a major dimension is the sensory motor dimension. So here we transcend our uh, organic body to interact with the environment by the senses, by the limbs, um, by the connecting ourselves with objects, by uh, transcending the body when we deal with objects, or by transcending the body when we deal with other subjects whom we kind of attached to our body. We have a kind of mutual embodiment here right now when we look at each other and I see you nodding and you see me talking. Then we are kind of extended bodies that interact with each other. 
So also here we do not stop here at the skin or in the or at the skull, but we are extended in in space, so to speak. So that is the second major dimension of embodiment. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, what is human being according to this embodied science? Well, the human being is uh, often taken to be something that I am as a subject, uh, that I am uh, as a self-conscious being, um, and uh, somehow reduced to a psychological state or psychological entity that, um, that continues over time. But uh, from an embodied point of view, I'm of course not only a subject when I'm aware of myself, but I'm still uh, continuous. Um, I'm living on when I, for example, fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just uh, um, uh, uh, vanishing uh, when, when, I, uh, when I fall asleep, but I'm still a living being. Mm -hmm. So the continuity of myself uh, essentially rests on the continuity of the, well, uh, uh, the life of my organism or the life of my body. And that means that uh, we cannot reduce uh, the human being, the human self or the human person to something psychologically, uh, um, to, to something psychological, which is then somehow uh, um, embrained or, or somehow localizable in the brain. But the human being is always the embodied person that I am, whether I'm conscious or uh, not conscious during sleep, doesn't play the decisive role. Mm -hmm. So the continuity of myself is the continuity of an embodied being, and that is what we usually call in Western uh, uh, philosophy and in Western thought the person, because the person is not something that we can localize within the organism. The person is always the human being as a whole. Do you think that uh, uh, the self is a good concept to uh, organize these uh, ideas about a human being? Yes, to a certain extent. If we see the self not just as a kind of uh, a, a kind of um, property of consciousness, a property of the psyche, mm -hmm. but if we see the self as an embodied self, that means, um, as I said before. The organism already is a kind of a self-reproducing self, um, system, a self-reproducing living being. And, and on this level of life, we already have this um, self-delimitation from the environment, so to speak, uh, which is necessary for the organism to uh, reproduce, to uh, sustain itself. But on the other hand, the this self-sustainment is dependent on the environment and we are in inter interacting with the environment through met metabolism, through sensory motor exchange. Mm -hmm. So already on this level there's the self of the organism but the self in contact and relation with the environment. Mm -hmm. And this is the basis for my <laughs> self or for ourselves to be uh, conscious, uh, to become conscious of themselves, to be in constant exchange with the environment as well, and to be in constant exchange with others. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be quite right to think of the self as just a mental or psychic entity. Mm -hmm. I think we should also embody the self mm -hmm. in that sense. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. The last question thank is, you. what is mental illness from a phenomenological standpoint? Okay, well, um, mental illness is nowadays often seen, uh, as lead, at least in psychiatry, as being a, a disease of the brain, as some kind of dysfunction that we have to uh, search for and by neuroimaging or other methods of neuroscience. Again, I would uh, um, object that mental illness is certainly somehow dependent on the brain as well, but brain dysfunctions are never the whole story. Brain dysfunctions are components of um, overarching um, cycle of um, relations to the world that are somehow disturbed. So uh, from an embodied point of view, uh, mental illness is some kind of disturbance in interactive cycles 
Um, again, sensory motor cycles, when, I, we, we, when we meet people with hallucinations, we would say that there is a disturbance of the usual sensory motor cycle that uh, creates um, real objects which we can interact with. But here, obviously, there is a disturbance in this uh, interactive cycle, uh, which makes hallucinations possible. But of course, the major uh, interactive cycle that is disturbed in, in mental illness is the, uh, the intersubjective cycle, so our relations with others. In all kinds of mental disorders, we have some kind of um, communicative disorder, um, inability to interact with others in a way that is uh, helpful for me, that is adequate, uh, that uh, gets me in contact with others. And all, some kind of interactive disturbance is characteristic for any mental illness. Uh, so in a sense, um, we should again not localize the illness within the patient somewhere within the body or within the brain, but we should rather uh, say that the patient is within is in the illness, so to speak, in a changed world, in a changed interaction. Mm -hmm. The illness surrounds the patient, so to speak, instead of being inside him. In, 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 hmm. in his uh, relations with yeah. with world, um, yeah. with, with, with others. Exactly, exactly. And um, if we look a, a bit closer at these uh, interactive cycles. You could also say it's an, a kind of ecological approach to mental illness because then uh, the, the environment is what is important for uh, really understanding the disorder. And if you look closer at, this, um, disturb at these disturbances, um, you find that they usually involve some kind of feedback or uh, fe a feedback loop that runs in, in the negative way, some, some kind of, uh, of, of devil's cycle, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, or dysfunctional feedback loops. So to take an example of depression, for example, um, uh, usually depression is uh, accompanied by a lack of uh, social resonance, emotional resonance. That will be observed by the, re by the uh, relatives, the acquaintances of the patient. And they will first try to interact with the patient in a normal way and to help him to be pitiful and so on. But then they realize that it doesn't work somehow and uh, they get somehow disturbed or irritated or even angry. And that is something the patient realizes and he, uh, he is aware of not being able to interact mm -hmm. with others in the usual sense. And that, again, increases his self-devaluation uh, self self and, and, and increases the depression. Mm -hmm. This, again, leads to more interactive disturbances and so on. Mm -hmm. In the same sense, you could say there is self-fulfilling prophecies going on in depression. Mm -hmm. I, have these automatic thoughts that I don't, won't achieve anything and that I'm not worthy of contact and that will lead to an increasing withdrawal. This increasing withdrawal again leads to a loss of reinforcement and again reinforces or, or uh, in, um, increases the depression. So all these are, when you look closely at it, uh, are interactive dysfunctional cycles, so to speak. And what we do in therapy is that we somehow try to counter these, this negative spin, so to speak, and to create uh, positive cycles mm -hmm. that uh, lead to an interaction that gradually enables increasing uh, contact with the world. Again, the, the brain is involved in all these cycles, but of course the brain doesn't create these cycles. The brain doesn't create the um, stigmatization, for example, that the patient experience, uh, experiences. The brain doesn't create the social interaction problems, but the brain is, cr uh, in uh, is integrated as part of these cycles, and it is also changed by these cycles, as we know today. Neuroplasticity shows that um, there is both a negative adaptation of the brain but there's also a positive adaptation of the brain if the, the functional cycles of interaction work in a positive sense, in a positive way, as for example in a successful psychotherapy, then the brain again adapts to this 
situation, uh, situation and creates uh, and, and, and enables uh, more positive experiences. So in, this, in a sense, the brain is always integrated and uh, mediates these uh, mm -hmm. cycles, but it is not the creator of mental illness. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you talk about uh, psychotherapy? One last qu yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. Uh, what do you think about uh, body-oriented psychotherapy in a phenomenological uh, way, uh, or in a phenomenological uh, approach? Uh, yeah. Well, um, from a f uh, phenomenology of the body, and also from a point of view of embodied cognition, uh, we should regard bodily experience as a integrated uh, holistic experience that is usually multimodal, so integrates different senses, integrates the situation as a whole, integrates my bodily feelings, which are the basis of emotions. All emotions, all moods have their bodily resonance. So in my view, uh, psychotherapy should much more uh, pay much more attention to this uh, holistic bodily experience because that is how uh, deeper and also pre-reflective, uh, non-explicit experiences can be created that uh, help to overcome the disorder gradually. So psychotherapy should not be something only on a reflective or explicit level of, of, of insight and, and, and understanding that is all important, but uh, we know today uh, that much more is happening underneath, so to speak, in our embodied interaction and the mood and the atmosphere that is created during the meeting, during the session. And we should pay much more attention to this pre-reflective, implicit or also non-verbal level of interaction. Okay, thank you very much, Professor, for You're sharing welcome. your ideas with us. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers to all. Thank you. Okay.